Praise be to God. Right now I'd like to do this topic surrounding Romans 4. And a big part of the teaching will be about not having the Spirit. Okay. There's all different winds of doctrine out there. You know, typically when they push the Romans 4, they push it as an easy believism, no repentance, and a once saved, always saved. Believe it or not, I met a guy face to face who was teaching such a damnable heresy. He was teaching an easy believism and then teaching against the once saved, always saved, which, you know, means that you get saved in an easy believism and then somehow you will have to repent later or you're going to lose your salvation so you lose salvation the same way you got it which it's an impossibility with the scriptures i mean it's lies if you teach you have to become an atheist to lose your salvation but you can't say that because once you bring up the churches to these people about having to repent of deeds They'll have to backpedal and say, well, the churches have to repent, but not like someone who's a total heathen. They just have to have a head knowledge. But it's the churches that maintain head knowledge. They have to repent of deeds or else they're going to lose salvation. So you do have to repent of deeds at some point. So even under their heresy, if they say it's a work salvation to teach you how to repent of sins from the onset to even get saved, they call that a work salvation they're going to have to also call their doctrine of works final salvation so they don't know what they speak and they'll might even say you know you don't necessarily have the holy spirit but you're saved you know so the holy spirit is only for the people filled with the spirit or whatever they might say but this is impossible if you not have the spirit of god you're not saved you never get saved to begin with without the holy ghost and maybe they're just not discerning and dividing scriptures on the spiritual gifts versus being baptized by one spirit into one body or having the seal of the spirit. There are differences in the gifts that you have versus the salvation you have. You're never going to have gifts without salvation, but there is a difference. You can have salvation with not having every gift or you can have salvation have the gift come to you maybe minutes after but the point is is that you're not saved without the holy ghost which means you're not saved without being holy okay there is no salvation outside of holiness okay and there's no progressive sanctification now romans 4 teaches against what they're teaching on uh, easy believism it's proved in the very context. If you don't want the context of what Paul is teaching, there's no point in just taking a few verses out of verse 4 and 5. See, in verse 3, it says, For what say the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, the scripture teaches that if you're in sin, you don't have a saving belief. Okay, I can go to different places. John 3 is one of the greatest examples. If you are in any evil deed, you don't come to the light. The light is Jesus. You do not come to Jesus if you're in evil deeds. It does not matter if you think you have or you say you do or your pastor says that you have. It doesn't matter. If you're in evil deeds, you haven't come to Jesus. You've just subtracted repentance. That's all you've done. And which, you know, is a major subtraction. And there's other proofs. Okay. And I'm going to go into one, but it's proof alone right there. Okay, Numbers 20 verse 12 as well is good, and Hebrews 3 is good, and there's different places we could talk to, talk about, excuse me, regarding this. But when people say this, it's very hard to use any logical reasoning with them. They don't want to hear another argument. They're looking for like a verbatim reading of a verse, because in their mind, verbatim these verses teach you just believe just believe just believe okay so it's hard to speak logic with them all right but you have to do that okay because then jesus said if you want to enter into life keep the commandments all right what are you going to do with that well you just don't want that verse all right 
Now, in Romans 4, 4, Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Okay? So we're using the word here that they use for transfer, but we're using it properly the way Paul used it for reckoning. It's even translated to reckon here in the fourth verse. This is the same word found in verse 3 for counted. Okay? And it's the same word found in verse 6 for impute. I don't really understand why the King James translated it in this way. It makes no sense to me, but it is useful against the heretic because it shows that it's not a transfer. It's a reckon and account. Those don't mean transfer, you know? So anyhow, in verse five, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now here, Paul expresses Two things to start, that Abraham, of course, believed God and he was saved without the Mosaic law. This is Paul's major point of what works is. Now, if you properly teach that the Mosaic law works cannot save you, you're going to rule out every other last quote unquote work salvation teaching. Okay, you're going to rule out Catholic teachings or do five good things to cover five bad things or the do-gooders or all of that. You just rule it out because if the Mosaic law, which was given by God, cannot forgive sins, there's nothing that you can come up with that will forgive sins. Okay. But what does forgive sins is belief. Okay. So taking the aforementioned verses on what precedes belief into this, we can see a very good teaching pop up in the context of the scriptures Paul uses. So in Romans 4, 6, it reads, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So David, a man under the Mosaic law. Okay, David even as a king of Israel and a man after God's heart cannot elevate himself over the Mosaic law. But Paul teaching the consistent teaching of the Bible that the Mosaic law never forgave anyone. And David had imputation without works, according to Paul. Okay. And this is why David would say, you know, it's the broken spirit, the broken heart. I'm paraphrasing more than the animal sacrifice okay but he did offer sacrifices because he was hearing and doing what he was told by god when he would listen to god and act on a hearing ear okay now having sins covered is an important teaching in the bible all right and i'm going to express why to you but just taking the reference point from the psalm, okay, and if we read the psalm, people who lie about salvation, whether it's initial or final or both, as I talked about certain types, these people do not have a good conscience, okay? They might have a hard deception, but they don't have a good conscience, before God and before men, okay? They most certainly do not have it before God, but it appears as well before men. You'll see the angst in them. You'll see the mockery in them. You'll see the slanders. You'll see evil for evil, okay? You'll see hypocrisy. This is what you will see. They might say that about you, but that's fine. They said that about him. They said that about our Lord, okay? But you can tell they don't have it. The types that need someone else to speak for them. They know you're wrong. They know that. Okay. The closet know it all. Oh, well, you can't know everything. But yet they keep telling you everything as if they're God. Okay. All these people are in major bondage to devils. And they're all going to perish in hell. Okay. And they don't have a good conscience. They might be deceived, might be hardened. They might know what they're doing. But they don't have a good conscience. They don't have a right spirit. Okay. So this is what David said in Psalm 32, 1. Blessed is he 
whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. David had many sins that he needed to be forgiven of. Of course, he was a man who asked to be forgiven after he did particular sins. He wasn't a one and done sort of guy. He had just hard, deep repentance which is a biblical repentance. David had this in backsides, and that's why he died in faith. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. See, these people have guile, okay? They're full of guile, okay? They're treacherous. They're malignant, okay? And deep down, they know it, okay? There are some people that come to shreds of honesty about things you're saying from the scripture about repentance and faith, what it really looks like in salvation. And they will even agree with you. They just won't do it. Okay. There's some that are even backsliders maybe. And they know, yeah, he's saying the right thing. But they're in a backslide, you know. And until they repent... You know, they don't forget about who God is. If it was David when broached by Nathan about such a man of poor character, what was that man worthy of? What would Yahweh do to such a man? Well, David understood by head knowledge. Okay. It drew him to repentance, no doubt, but he still had to repent. In whose spirit there is no guile. None. You might say, well, we're all sinners. There's got to be some sin. Well, what if there's the sin of guile in particular? Well, that's a man imputed with iniquity, according to David, according to Paul, according to God. Okay. So they know they're not saved. Okay, and they're using a great amount of guile in Romans 4 because they're denying the very context right here in Psalm 32. Okay, and the Mosaic law not forgiving sins point that Paul is making. Now, this is shown in the scriptures, and this is why we as saints, we know we have salvation. We're the ones that have the real assurance of salvation. Okay, yes, we believe in the conditional security that God has taught us, and we believe God has to judge this way for him to be just because your mind would never say otherwise. Okay. There is no point in worshiping these other gods that they're talking about. No repentance of sin to be saved. No enduring to the end to be saved or both. There's no reason to worship those gods. They're not just. What's the point? That kind of God can get it wrong all the time. All right. Now, when speaking of Abraham, okay, he brings up the circumcision, okay? Of course, Paul's point is he got saved before circumcision, but Abraham was given something as a shadow to us, okay? What we see with the Holy Ghost. Abraham had the Holy Spirit. David had the Holy Spirit when they were right with God. There's no doubt. You cannot be saved today without the Spirit, Okay? And that's what Paul taught in Romans 8. All right. Yeah, they come around and they say, you know, you can have faith and be saved without having the spirit. They're doing this to trip you up on holiness. They're tripping you up on a progressive sanctification or something. Not all people say that, but when they do, they're saying something that's a fraud. You're not saved without the spirit of God. Okay. The reason why is because God gives the spirit to everyone that has saving faith because it's a seal okay in verse 11 and he received the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised all right so abraham received an outward order of god for this nation of people of abraham okay and it was a seal all right. Now we get the seal of the Holy Spirit, which men had as well in the Old Testament. You can lose that seal. Seals break in the Bible. It's just the way it is. But that seal of having the Spirit of God is important because, okay, 
it's important because repentance of sins is not enough to save you. Okay. You've committed the sins and you're guilty before God. Okay. And there's no doubt about that. All right. In verse five of Romans four, it speaks that God justifies the ungodly. Now, Paul, who was quoting the Old Testament to make his point and points in this chapter, would never contradict what the Old Testament taught about justification. Okay. Because the Old Testament teaches that God will not justify the wicked, that God justifies the righteous. We know justification by faith happens in a prayer, such as, Father, forgive us of our sins. Okay. Or the publican. Okay. There's no doubt about that. Paul would not contradict things God was saying in the Old Testament about his justification, about his judgment, about his imputation. So Paul's point is that you stand before a holy God guilty of these sins. And there is a debt. Jesus taught this in parables. He taught to pray, forgive us of our debts. Okay as we forgive those that are indebted unto us. And there is a debt. So by the debt, you're in a position of ungodliness. You weren't created to do these things. You're guilty of these things. You have to be judged of these things. Okay. Now, that's why repenting of sin is not enough. You can repent I don't know, say you committed 97 sins from your youth to the very day you repented of your sins. You stopped doing the 97 sins, but you're guilty of all of them. Okay. That's why the Mosaic law cannot help you. Okay. So that's why repentance alone, when contextually used, will not help you. I mean, it's not talking against what Paul was teaching in 2 Corinthians 7 or what Jesus was teaching in Luke 13. But if you're speaking of just repenting of sins, you cannot be saved just repenting of sins. Okay. You have to have faith in the Son of God because you need to be forgiven. And this is what the Father has put forth. Okay. All those signs and shadows and figures and things like this out of the Old Testament mean something. Now, if one of your sins as well, the 98th, if you will, was rejecting the gospel, in that sense, repentance would clear it all because now you would, of course, receive the gospel by faith. However, I think you get my point. You have to have faith in the Son of God. So you have to have the right Son. Okay. So even the head knowledge alone guys have to deny people that aren't repenting of sins. If they get the wrong Jesus, they're not going to be saved. I mean, maybe some will allow for it if they're really staunch against repentance of sin. But you get my point. They got their limits too. So you get the Aryan son. Ain't going to save anyone. It's a devil. You know? Now, my point is, is that the repentance of the sins is what allows the father to hear you by his standard. He cannot stop being who he is. Okay. Now the father will hear you cry out for the salvation in the name of Jesus. Because there is no other name. That faith purifies the heart. Okay. Whether it could be shame or paranoia or fear of death that all these past sins have brought to you. You have stopped them, but it's not just a mere positional thing, okay? It's the verse here in 5 that speaks to the position, okay? That God can take someone guilty positionally, ungodly, if you will, to a righteous person before him because of what Jesus did. He won't do it to someone still living ungodly because that would defeat his words in the prophets, okay? It would make the foundation null. Okay. But the faith as well does something for how you 
think, your conscience, your heart, your spirit, okay? There is no guile indeed, but there's no shame, okay? It's taken away. And this is given to us in proof by the giving of the Holy Spirit, okay? If I go over to Isaiah 30, this is the Holy Spirit in salvation. It's not just spiritual gifts. If you have the spiritual gifts, you're saved. There is no spiritual gifts given to the unsaved. But this precedes that. It could just be fractions of time. I mean, they spoke with tongues very quickly. Okay, you see in the book of Acts. You know, and Paul, you know, talked about, I think it says straight away he went and preached Christ. Okay, so it wasn't long after his conversion that he was a preaching, you know, but here it says, Woe to the rebellious children, verse 1 of Isaiah 30, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. So the covering, not of his spirit, but adding sin to sin, and they go back to Egypt. So this is the way it happens for a backslider. They move away from the spirit and they add sin to sin. So anyone saying you somehow get saved without the spirit and then you somehow lose salvation later, that's not what God is saying. Okay. You go without the covering of the spirit. You go away from the seal. Okay. The one that has the seed, the one that has the seal, the one that has the spirit does not sin. It's when they start to sin, they lose all that. Okay. Because the Holy Spirit is not going to partake in your sins. Okay. I think there's a good verse about this in Romans 5. Okay. I'll go to Romans 5 right now. Verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So we have the Holy Ghost given unto us. Okay. And there's no shame there. Okay. This hope we have, we're saved by hope, maketh not ashamed. You see people living in shame. Okay. And deep down they know it. They'll even admit it. You know, they'll admit they're a rotten sinner. And then somehow in their deception, they think they're saved. It's just diametrically opposite to the salvation taught in the Bible. It defeats the whole purpose of what the seal is. They can mention a seal and they can tell you what they think being sealed means despite what it is taught in the scriptures. But there's no practicality to it. You know? There's nothing there with any substance. You know? But that's what faith does, whether it's Acts 15. That there's a purification there and it's given by the Spirit. The Spirit writes these things on your heart. Okay, it's like if you have not the Spirit, you're none of His. You know, but if you're led of the Spirit, you know, you're a son of God. But it also says the Spirit is given. This is what Jesus did. It's in John 1. And it's a power to become the sons of God, which is children of the resurrection of the just. So there is initial and final salvation in the teaching as well. But there's an actual hope there. There's an actual purification there that sinners just don't have. They just don't have it. Okay. It does not matter how much they say they have it. They just don't. Okay. And, but the seal speaks for itself. That Holy Ghost power speaks for itself. The confession of faith that you see in the scriptures of men who had the Holy Ghost speaks against these sinners that are somehow saved. That's why they deny the professions, okay, for doctrine of men, because they just don't actually have it. See, they've been so indoctrinated by a transrighteousness and this justification surrounding these few verses in Romans 4, denying Abraham and David. Okay, because Abraham was a friend of God. And you're no one's friend of the Godhead living in sin, according to Jesus. Okay. 
if you're my friend, you'll do whatsoever I command you. If you love me, keep my commandments. They don't. Okay. They'll admit it. So that's what they've admitted to. All right. They've been so indoctrinated on a false justification that they think it's true. Now, what the pastors don't indoctrinate as much is a progressive sanctification, although they do. And certainly they don't talk about perfection. It's a word almost taboo. Okay. Because perfection can mean moral perfection. It can mean a completeness, of course. It means blameless. Okay. These are all things the pastors aren't even, and they're supposed to be. But they don't talk about that because deep down, they know they can't sell that. You can't start selling a positional perfection without a practical. Because there's just not a lot of verses they can tweak on it, like they can with Paul's writings on justification. And it just doesn't make sense. I mean, being held innocent in like a courtroom setting, it is something we understand in our society. And this is all they care about. They don't care about practicing anything. They don't care. The prophet said it's lawful and right not to sin, you know, and live. It doesn't deny faith because in the prophet, Ezekiel especially, it says for you to make yourself a new heart and a new spirit because if you don't, you'll die. And why will you die, O house of Israel? And then as well, it says that God will give you a new heart because he gives you the spirit. It says here in 2 Corinthians 1.22, who has also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. So we make ourselves a new heart and a new spirit by repentance and faith. Repenting of sins. And then God gives us the spirit. See, if God would not give this, you would still yet be ashamed of your sins. You would still yet have a bad conscience. Even though you stop doing something, if God isn't there to forgive you, you're not going to feel right about it. Okay, you're still going to have that guilt, but that is taken away by Jesus, but it actually means something. It's not merely positional. Positional is very important. There's no doubt about it, but it is how you have a relationship with God. There's people, they deny the religion, twist the relationship. Okay. There's people that might just focus on the religious portion, deny the relationship. I mean, there could be different combinations, but you got to have both. You have the high priest, you have this religious teaching in the scriptures of the high priest who offers his own blood. This is religious and it's good, but you also have to have the friendship, okay? And you're just going to be torn in your sins. You're not going to have it with God and these people don't have it, all right? So when you say they don't, they don't like that. They're not sealed with the spirit of God. And if they're backsliders, they're unsealed. Okay. Period. But it's proven in their own hearts. Okay. And there's proverbs about this, you know, how, you know, when you look into water, you see yourself. So when you look into your heart, you see the kind of person you are. Okay. Because a real saint knows that there's that circumcision of the heart that they're called to do. And then they also read in the prophets that God does it too. And that's where the spirit is. It's proof of the work of Christ, the giving of the spirit, being part of his body, being sealed, being saved. Okay. And there's different verses that could be looked at on circumcision and the giving of the spirit. But it's just something sinners don't have. All right. And it's not anything you can force anyone to do. It's a choice. You know, love being someone's friend is a choice. You can't force someone to be your friend. People do it all the time for money. They do it for pleasure. And not Moses though. Moses didn't want the pleasures of sin for a season. He forsook Egypt, did not want to be called by Pharaoh or Pharaoh's daughter. The exact wording is found in Hebrews 11, but he had faith. And that's what Egypt 
figures for us is sin and bondage. And these people are in bondage to their sins in Egypt. And without repenting of sins, it's never going to work. Okay. Repenting of sins is what gets you heard. Okay. And a real faith takes it away. There is a cleansing, okay? Not just religiously, not just positionally, but it's also there in actuality and practice. There's an actual, yes, I am a friend of God. You know, there is such a thing as confessing. This is what God does in someone's life, okay? Like David would talk about in 2 Samuel 22, 29 through 34. There is such a thing. And there is no other way. Okay. And I could probably end at Galatians 4. People need to start getting serious. You know, if you hear some real preaching and they're not wishy-washy, not bouncing around sins, leaving out half and only going by half. I mean, they're really coming against all sin. You know, check yourself. See if the preacher's got it right. Because you ain't going to pass the judgment being in sin. You don't even have the Spirit of God. You know? Your whole life is Christless. You're against the light. You've made the tree corrupt and your fruit is corrupt. I don't care how many good deeds you think you do. It ain't going to cover your sins. I don't care how many easy believism tracks you passed out. You serve the devil. Okay. Galatians 4, 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Okay. So we have the spirit of God, the spirit of even his son, the Holy Ghost, who Jesus said would come and he would send. And there are gifts of the spirit, but you don't have the spirit. You're none of his. Okay. And the spirit is the seal. So there is no doctrine. If you don't have the spirit, you might still be saved, but you'll get the spirit later. If you progress in sanctification, this is a folly, of course. And there is no doctrine of having the spirit and sin. Okay, because sin is shameful. Okay, you have a hope in shame. It's impossible with what Paul taught. And that's what it's all about. It's all about repenting because you can sin willfully and do despite the spirit of grace. You can fail the grace of God and things like this. So, this is what the Bible is teaching surrounding Romans 4. It's a very deep teaching, if you will, that Paul can cover this many bases. You know, a saint before the Torah, a saint during the Torah. Make sure people know the Torah is not going to do it for you. Also, make sure people know, you know, if you don't have a spirit with no guile, it ain't going to work for you. As well, teach about the seal that Abraham had related back to us is well in the writing. Certainly there in the fifth chapter, no doubt. And there's a promise. Does God make conditional promises? Maybe this would be someone's next point. Well, of course he does. I can promise you, okay, from what I know about the Bible. If you, if you, he also teaches endurance with Abraham, and I think this is the point. I think you'll actually find similarity between Romans 4 and James 2 if you keep going to Romans 4, but there is a fulfilling to fill up measure on being God's friend that you maintain the friendship, okay? God makes a promise to every sinner today that they will burn in hell. It's a guarantee, okay? That if you die as a sinner, you burn in hell. It's conditional though, because as you're breathing, there's a condition that if you repent and you have faith, you will not burn in hell. So there are conditional promises. Praise the Lord. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made him. Thank you.
eyes of the blind, the Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made him. Of the blind, the Lord raiseth them that are bad.